Welcome to the JVM Language Summit. We are now online. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about confinement. I'm going to back up and talk about abstraction. I'm going to back up way up and talk about the history of logic a little bit. And then I'm going to give some proposals, assuming I get through the whole talk. Um, but I, I want to say that Java gives you really good abstractions. They give, it gives you abstractions that are defended at runtime as well as uh, enforced at compile time. And that's, uh, that's, that, gives you, um, that gives you a lot of, of confidence when you're trying to reason about what your classes are doing, what your objects are doing. Um, sometimes uh, a good abstraction will have to be paid for in learning curve, but um, often the, uh, uh, oftentimes it's usually worth it if it's a well-tuned abstraction. Um, a bad abstraction is really expensive, much more expensive than a good one. So if, you, if you're tired of having uh, to pay for, say, a garbage collector, go back to using malloc and free and, and see how that costs you. Uh, usually, not always, but usually it, you want to you, you want to let the GC do the heavy lifting for you there. Not always, um, but when you have when you have a, a, a badly tuned abstraction, something where the invariants are uh, on a good day only, or the invariants have lots of fine print in them, um, you will pay for it, um, even though your implementer says, "Well, this is the best I could do cheaply for you." So Java is proof that you can do better cheaply enough. Um, by the way, these uh, I'm going to I'm going to go fast with these slides. It's the way I like to go, and I, I I'm a slide pack rat, so I put as many points as I can on each slide, and then I move to the next. So what that means is there won't be time for me to explain every phrase in here, but that's okay. I, I hope to motivate what's in every slide for you. And if you want to go see more, I've put in links. Um, I've put in more supporting detail. And th these PDF, th this will be posted as a PDF uh, for posterity. So we know, what's in, we know what's in Java. We like what's in Java, don't we? And, uh, there's um, the, the original white paper lists the the cool stuff in Java, and and you can if you put on your uh, today's talk spectacles, you can say yeah those are all abstraction mechanisms classes yes check abstraction safe manage pointer you check abstraction and abstraction is something that that uh, provides you an invariant an abstraction is something where you you don't have to tell yourself the whole story of the machine that's running you ju you just can tell yourself a, a limited story and it'll still be true. Um, the thesis for today is that there's something that I'd like to define as confinement, which enables and enhances abstraction, and then moving back to the sort of ground truth of Java, there are some things we can do in Java which, which can incrementally improve its confinement properties and so, for some abstractions. Um, it's really fun to introduce something like Lambda because suddenly you have Lambda abstraction as a tool, right? You can, um, you can write new APIs that express um, new kinds of invariants, new kinds of, uh, of requests. This is an example of Java growing. Java has been growing for 20 years, and we're really proud to say it's going to keep growing. That uh, The JVM Language Summit is, is in some ways a, uh, a, a visit to the future of Java, and where we get to talk about stuff before it's fully baked. Um, the Please move forward slide. All right, fine. Um, what, what confinement does for you is it gives you a magic circle around some piece of code that you want to understand and prevents causes from coming in that are unaccounted for. That's the, that's the basic idea here. Um, confinement, again, using today's talk spectacles, if you look, you can see confinement everywhere. And a good example of that is class-based uh, access control. You, you put a circle around a class, and you say everything that's private within that class is inside, uh, uh, inside a fence, inside a, 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 a series of um, a barbed wire fence, a series of protections that prevent people from just reaching into the class and changing something or extracting a secret. Both of those are bad. Um, without your permission. If you want to provide secrets or if you want to allow something to change, you provide an access function that's, that's not private. So that's, a, that's an example of confinement. Perhaps it's a term that's so uh, broad that uh, anything can fit to it. Um, but in any case, I have some particular suggestions that we'll get to. Um, 
Uh, freezing, um, better immutability is something that we can work on. Also, I think, uh, I think it's time to talk about uh, putting in online checks for arresting races, uh, speed traps, if you will. Um, and also, I want to talk a very small amount about lambda cracking, uh, which is a way to um, uh, have libraries work more intelligently with their lambdas. So, backing up to the 10,000 foot level, um, what is abstraction? Let me give a uh, working definition that when you're faced with something really complicated, uh, if you can tell the truth about part of it and that truth helps you, then contemplate that part. That part is an abstraction that is pulled out of the whole. It gives, it gives the mind some rest to think about uh, what, what it is that you're, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing in, in the subset, uh, the model of, of, the, of the whole reality. Um, of course, once people realized that they were doing abstractions, which is as soon as they could talk, I think, then um, it became a game to think about what is abstraction. Uh, so, of course, we abstracted abstraction, and that led to 2,500 years of very interesting philosophy. Um, but the, the, it seems to be a, uh, a consensus that, that is 2,500 years old, that there is a sort of a logical account that you want to build, and you want it to be both true and also not the whole thing. So how do you make something that's true but not the whole thing? This leads to like the medieval discussion about the problem of universals. Um, quantifiers were discovered apparently by Aristotle 2,500, 2,400 years ago, and, uh, and they've been puzzling people, people ever since. Um, when you bring in formal methods, then you begin to enable things like what we do for, for, for our day jobs. Um, and so the, you, can, you can look at our place in the world as being atop a very uh, laboriously built tower of concepts that started with quantifiers and brought in uh, algebra, uh, brought in the, uh, the, the unification of logic and algebra by George Boole, um, and then brought in uh, set theory, um, machines, uh, metamathematics, and finally, 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 programming languages. But I think those are all steps that depend on each other. And so I, it, uh, it makes, me, makes me happy to think not only that we're doing this cool 21st century thing, but it's also a very old enterprise. I do want to also call out um, my favorite logician uh, because he has taught me, um, his books have taught me about these about some of these matters in a very beautiful way. He also passed away at the age of 97 uh, this year, and uh, I've been enjoying his work since I was an undergraduate, and he, um, I, I just want to recommend that particular book, also uh, Mathematical Logic by Raymond Smullyan. It will, uh, it will delight and enlighten you if you are at all interested in logic, and I think that includes all of us in the room. Uh, his, um, his book on set theory introduced me to temporal logic in a, just a charming and useful way that uh, set me up for um, appreciating um, some of um, Les, uh, Leslie Lamport's work. Anyway, back to abstraction. With respect to computing, an abstraction is when you pull out a piece of a program that's worth looking at it by itself. Since programs are formal entities, um, uh, a formal account of a piece of a program is probably just a fragment of that program, and that's the way I'm going to go with it. Um, abstractions are separable, and so they need, you need to be able to say, it's true what this thing says, and I can make, make true statements about this piece of code, and even though it's integrated with and entangled with a much larger system. Uh, the, the, the work, um, the role of specification is very important there. And this brings us to um, confinement. In a dynamical uh, formal system, which is software, uh, there's causes and effects flying around all over the place. And so you have, to, um, you have to take into account causes, and you, just as importantly, you have to block away causes so that they don't affect the, the abstraction that you're trying to build. And that's why confinement, in, as, as I'm defining it, is a good design heuristic. So there's a boundary of a, a, a confined piece of code has a boundary, and across that boundary, uh, causes go out, where the code is affecting something else in the system, causes come in, where so the code is, is being affected. And we want to remove the uh, irrelevant and disruptive causes. Uh, there's many examples of incoming and outgoing causes that you could list. Um, some causes go both ways. Uh, I don't know how to make that, I don't know how to de decouple a CAS into a cause, a, the, the, one cause that goes in each direction. So maybe it's a bi-directional cause in that case. Um, 
local causes are, of course, don't cross the boundary, and they're, in, they're completely inside the abstraction, so you can reason about them more easily. Here's a visualization of, of the mag magic circle of a confinement boundary, and here's some causes and effects that go uh, outside of it. Let's, let's use an example. Um, here is a piece of code. What does it do? Uh, what are the possible cause and causes and effects? And uh, put your Java puzzler mindset on, because um, there, there can be some surprising answers here, can't there? Well, um, in the simple case, uh, you're just in a local subroutine, and this is the this is the this is the par essential uh, par excellence um, abstraction. This is what you want most of the time. Um, there's there really is only a few things that can happen. There's a call and return. There's invoke. There's return. Um, not much going on. That's okay. But if the variable's in the heap, there's more to say, right? That's when you get uh, interesting stuff going on. Um, here's, here's what it looks like when you have a, a something in the heap. Uh, first, you read X, and uh, you're reading it from a, a memory state somewhere, um, and then you're going to write X again. So that looks pretty normal, but um, I doubled those arrows to make them look a little scarier, because they, they at least scare me. Um, one thing that can happen is the first time you touch a static is uh, you could trigger a CL init call, right? So that could, that could cause a whole boatload of effects. That's, that's a surprise, just that one little X there. Um, you might also have um, a linkage error if you have a, uh, a, a miscompiled class. And, uh, and then, of course, the thing that uh, really uh, makes containment difficult or makes containment necessary is the, the race condition. So here's, uh, here's an example of a... Um, of a CL init call that, that then uh, uh, enables the read to continue and return a value. Make sense? And here's an example of a race condition. Here, between the brown lines, somebody wedges in a, an effect that, uh, that's, that is going to have to be accounted for in the abstraction inside your magic circle. You're going to have to worry about that. Um, so we want to make sure that we make a careful accounting of everything that can come in or go out of the circle. And part of the problem there is some of our circles are leaky. This is when, um, when, when you have an abstraction that works only on a good day, but then on a bad day, an effect comes in from, from a place that you weren't expecting and makes your program crash. That's, uh, uh, that's what keeps us paid, um, a lot of us, right, a lot of days. But I, you know, of course, we want to avoid this so we can do the stuff that we really enjoy. Um, anyway, so I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Java memory model. And this by itself could be a three-hour talk. And there are some very good three-hour talks out there. I want to recommend Alexei Shipilev's right up front. His, his blog on this stuff is excellent. Uh, but so, you know, we, we, we know about the Java memory model, because after all, we use Java, and Java has memory, and memory has state, and JMM's about state, and so what more is there to say, really, right? Um, I learn something new every time I, I reread the Java memory model spec, and that was true this week also. It's kind of scary. Um, but hey, uh, buy me a beer, and we'll talk about it. Um, the easy parts. Threads run concurrently. Life is great if you're, if you're only in one thread, right? What could go wrong? Nothing, really. There's no race conditions, at least. It's very easy to, to wrap a good confinement and make a good abstraction inside of one thread. Threads can, can um, communicate through actions on the heap. Um, there, you, ex you make sure that those actions are properly synchronized by use of a combination of the keywords synchronized, final, uh, volatile, if those keywords are not in your program and not in the, um, not in the libraries you're using, then you're probably um, going to the, win the race contest. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there are, even if you're, now Java, because Java makes variables variable by default, not fixed, um, it follows that there are potential race conditions everywhere you look inside of a Java program. Um, you have to work very hard to prove there aren't race conditions. And therefore, of course, the Java memory model does something which C++ didn't do. It says, if you, if you, do, if you 
commit an indeterminate action, we are at least gonna give you minimal safety guarantees on it. We will not give you a bad pointer. Uh, we will not make up a random value for you. That's good. Um, uh, recent C++ compilers um, are not so friendly. But even that is, is not reasons to sleep uh, well at night. Um, there's some more easy parts here. Uh, there's something called happens before, which is a concept uh, from Leslie Lamport. Um, that guy's been all over this kind of stuff for three decades. Um, he's still working on it. So happens before two events, well, one happens before the other, or they do not, be, they're not related at all. Those are the only three possibilities. Um, it's, a, it's a nice little irreflexible part, irreflexive partial order. Every thread is fully ordered, boring, sequential. So inside um, a thread, the events march in, in strict sequence. Monitor, exit, exit, monitor, enter, volatile reads and writes, they also are linked by this relation. So we're beginning to build up a partial order, and you know, most of you have probably studied that some time, at some point. You know how that works. It's gonna help us uh, stay sane, right? We hope, yes. Declare victory, no, not quite, not yet. Um, normal reads and writes, which are the default, right, in Java. Um, if you just don't write anything special, you get a normal read and a normal write. They do not create these links. You think they do, I think, I think they do, uh, on a day when I can conveniently forget the Java memory model, but actually they don't. They don't create these causal links. They rely on them. What does this mean? Well, here is a graphic that I invite you to study more later, but um, the idea is memory is in the middle of a bunch of threads, and the threads are talking to memory, and through, they're talking through memory to each other, okay? and there are causal links going from instructions in th the threads to places in memory and through to the other side to other threads. The strong, the non-dotted lines, the solid lines, are in the Java memory model events which, um, uh, which do create these happens before relations, so you can reason about them in terms of causality. The dotted lines are mere data flow. They are not causally determinative. The data flow rides on top of the, of the other more rare links. So the, the, the freedom of the, of the program to reorder itself is uh, based on this, the sparsity of the solid arrows, even though there might be zillions of dotted arrows. The dotted arrows can be reordered any old way that is consistent with the solid arrows. So let me give you an example. Here, I've, I've crafted this so that there is a, um, there is a release and then an acquire. That's, that's what this JMM calls them. Um, a monitor exit and then a monitor enter in another thread. And so the red lines are, are some relevant solid arrows, some happens before relations. Um, and you'll notice that because they connect all the way from one thread to the other, you have a happens before linkage between two threads. That's good. We're winning. And that means that the dotted arrows which are related, which are touching those, those red arrows are also properly ordered with respect to the two threads. So those dotted lines that have the blue lines next to them uh, are nailed down by the Java memory model. But all the other lines, the lines that you think should also be nailed down, are not. Uh, you're, you're, you're lucky if you get something useful out of them. You get race, they are racy, they are racy uh, lines. Um, so if, if things are that bad, then why aren't we already insane? Well, um, you can hope that you're that you have excluded all races from your program. It's really sad because um, if your thread is, for its part, race-free, it's very easy for another thread just to touch it and make a race. Oops, both threads have to agree in handshake to make race-free. All right, but maybe I've got that. Maybe I'm like protecting myself from other threads and hiding my data. Maybe I'm data race-free. If so, I win sequential consistency. And that's okay. It's not the, um, it's still, you're still in a world of hurt even if you have sequential consistency. But that's the prize you win if you get rid of data races. Okay, fine. Um, answer number two, I'm not, I'm not insane because I use an, a restricted implementation of the J, JMM that uses fences. Fences are the way it really works, right? Because that's what the compiler cookbook says. Uh, that's not true. Alexi uh, uh, debunks that myth very, very well. Um, I, I, again, I refer you to his blog. Well, um, you know what? That's, uh, that's a temporary condition. 
maybe the JMM is friendly to me because I'm using the right implementation of it, but uh, that's not true tomorrow. Uh, or maybe I'm just lucky. And anybody that gets the bugs, uh, they must have done something wrong. They, they deserve to fall into the snake pit. Um, or I read a lot of Stack Overflow, and I just know the right incantations. And, and I'm so lucky and, and I'm so uh, hidebound, um, compulsive, that I write the, the same incantations every time, and so I never, I never get a race in my, in my program. That might be why I'm, why I'm OK. Some combination of these reasons, I think, is the reason why things work. Also, you know, if, if most of what you're doing is in one thread, then you're OK, right? Uh, but remember, threads are increasing in number all the time. So we're getting pressure to do more and more multi-threaded. Uh, we're we're going to make threads cheaper and more numerous um, when Ron Pressler's work kicks in. That's going to be exciting. So what is, what is sequential consistency to round that off? Well, um, it's as if you'd shuffled all of your execution traces together like a deck of cards. That's what it is. Uh, and isn't that, all, isn't that the only thing you can get? Ha ha, no, by no means, by no means. Caches actually screw up the shuffling so that you're, there is no such thing as a global memory state that is serialized. Um, there is no such thing as a unique most recent write in the, in the real world. You have to, um, even with sequential consistency, you still have to guess which interleaving you get, but at least you don't get uh, really weird, um, like simultaneous values in the, in the same variable. That's what you get with a normal Java memory model in a race. The ver uh, one variable can look like it has two different values in two different places at the same time, because there is no same time. Um, OK, what do you get if you get a race? Well, this is the thing I want you to take away. I'm going to say it a few times. Any given variable, when it reads, when, it, when you read it, you can see any right to that variable, almost any right, if it is racy, if, if, you're, not, if you're not nailed down by those, uh, by those blue and red arrows. It's pretty stunning to, to actually come to terms with that reality. There are a few cases which are often enough so that we're still sane, but there are, there's, a, there's a, a frighteningly small number of cases where uh, the memory model says, no, stop it. You have to read this right when you read. And it's only, um, it's only in the case that I show you. W0 and W2 are the only. Um, are, are the only forbidden rights. Everything else is allowed. So you better have everything very strictly tied down. So if you have some other racing 007 variable out there that, that's writing to your variable, like, the, like the, an attacker, and I, I fixed security bugs like this. Um, you have to buy me several beers to hear about that one. But um, you, you, you have an attacker that goes in and takes a perfectly well-structured program, and he manages to get a reference to a variable, and he smashes something in racially in a concurrent thread. You can, you can, you can break the system. You can, root, you can root kit the system. So in practice, we avoid crazy stuff, but we don't avoid it well enough to avoid bugs and security escalations. Um, we sprinkle the right keywords on it, but if we don't understand what we're doing, or if we don't have more help, that's what I'm arguing for today, then uh, we, we still have problems. We can make it better. Uh, without class-based encapsulation, where you, act, you can actually make variables private so you can really prove invariance about who can touch them, we'd be in a world of hurt. We wouldn't be, ha we wouldn't, Java would not be what it is today without, without privacy. Okay. Um, Here's an example of a 007 guy coming in. Uh, there he is. Ha! You thought you had a perfectly nailed down program, but if you, let a, if you let a reference get out to one of your variables and some attacker or some doofus made a thread to go and write to it, it just, it's a tentacle that reaches in and spoils the, uh, the delicate um, symmetry of your, uh, of your program. Here's a worse case. Um, suppose you have Suppose you read the same variable twice back to back. What could go wrong? Well, you can actually, the Java memory model says any, a, a read can read any write that can, that can connect to it. Um, and the connections are very broad. There's, there are very few limitations on the connections. So uh, those two, R1, R2, can read the initial value of A or the initial value of the, of the sorry, the variable. It can get a null pointer exception on A. Um, it can, and either one can read either of 42 or 0 in any order. 
It's just that's the way it really works. If you don't put volatile, final, or synchronized in your program, that's what really can happen. It just doesn't happen that often. Does that make you feel good? It's a little tiny little gap in the containment fence. All right. Um, yeah, you, that's why you put volatile everywhere. Now, the, the 007 guy, uh, this, is, um, this is a real thing that really happens and causes uh, lots of damage. There's a thread 007 that's just pouring bad data into um, some pointer he's gotten hold of. And the poor guy who's trusting this, um, the, the, the memory model that doesn't really exist because it's only in his head and has a wishful thought, he says, well, I'll sanity check the operand, and then I'll use the operand. What could go wrong? Well, you sanity check a good operand, and then a microsecond later, it's a bad one, or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, this is very bad with verargs, because in verargs, you don't even see the array creation, so it's hard to see from the source code that there is a piece of mutable state that can be manipulated, and yet this is, this is one way that black hats get in. <sighs> so what, what's to do? Um, yeah, I just wrote a poem to summarize. All right, let's talk about what works. Um, let's put a volatile in there and let's hope for something better. Um, so there's a, there's a release when you read a volatile. There's a re release when you write a volatile. So T1 does a release and T2 does an acquire. And at that point, you do have some causality that's nailed down unless somebody managed to get a handle on A and is putting garbage into it concurrently. So I, here's, a, here's a reference to um, Shipolef's uh, discussion called Close Encounters, and this uh, particular interesting area is uh, in his blog is called Avoiding Pitfalls. In, the, in terms of the previous diagram, there is a release when you unlock or write a volatile, and there's an acquire in the other thread when you lock and, and or read the, uh, the, the corresponding thing on the other side. And that's what gives you the, the nice red and, and blue lines. Moral of the story, um, uncertainty can't be wished away. Um, it, even if you feel close to the hardware and you're writing those non-volatile racy reads and writes and it seems to be working and you feel like you and the hardware have this really good kinship going on, um, sympathy, you know, with the, with the mechanics of it, it's, it's not gonna last, sorry. Um, if, you, if you can't actually code to a spec, then you're racing somewhere that's nowhere. Uh, Lamport said in one of his talks, um, a spec is more important when you don't know what the program's doing. <laughs> so that's, that's not when you treat the spec as optional, either coding to or writing a spec. Um, how many of you have noticed that the recent um, C++ compilers are getting more uh, legalistic with you and, and, and giving you bad, bad results because you transgressed some little tiny corner of the language? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I've been noticing that. Java has always gone a different way. Java doesn't say, unless you can make the optimizer happy, it's gonna give you bad data, ha <laughs> ha. Java says, we're gonna give you something reasonable and we're gonna make it fast. That is an awesome feature of Java and it's related to the online checks that it does. It's more important to do this, at, uh, it's more important to get, it, get these things right um, at the invariant level, at the programmer service level, than let's make the optimizer go fast level. Let's get the optimizer in spite of the language, uh, in spite of the language semantics. So anyway, uh, once more, the bad news is, unless you have releases and acquires, there are races. If there are races, any read is a candidate for any write. Any write is a candidate for any read. Um, and you no, you're probably not okay with that. There's not much more to say than that. It, it, you don't get values out of the air, but um, that's the only good part about it. There are benign races, but they're very hard to set up right. And you don't get a diagnostic if you make a mistake. You just get a race, and it works, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. The best benign race is uh, when you write something exactly once. Uh, this only works for final variables, because other than final variables, the Java memory model will give you, give you a, a racer a choice of two writes, the initializing write and the write that you wanted. Oops. Uh, and the second best is when you're okay with all the values that the, that the racing writes are writing. And that's, sometimes that's okay. 
uh, but it's not okay as often as you would wish. Um, we could impose uh, sequential consistency all the time, uh, thereby sort of removing races by, you know, by fiat. Um, it's, it's, de it's debatable how slow this would get. There's a silently shifting semicolon that claims hand wave, hand wave, that we should really do this, and it's a Java-like thing to do maybe, to just say, well, we're gonna do no more races, and we'll figure out how to optimize it anyway. But um, uh, we, I, I think that the cost would be, would be enough to make people go to C++ instead of Java, and that would be sad for me. Um, people who need races, even if we went sequential consistency, consistency could use var handles, so that's a good thing. Um, races are sometimes the best answer. If you're willing to take all those caveats and the multiple uh, indeterminate values, and you can trust in NUTA, which is the not out of the air uh, invariant that uh, JMM gives you. It's not a cure-all, though. It's really hard to manage mutability, even under sequential consistency, which is the grand prize of the Java memory model. So uh, have you looked at the boilerplate lately on, sorry, Brian, on, um, on the Streams API? Brian and his team did brilliant work writing this all up. But when, it comes, when you come down to it, it's one of those specifications which you say, I guess I can learn to live with this, uh, given how useful it is for me. But um, uh, it's funny that it can't be simpler, isn't that? Uh, it, so sequential consistency, if you win that, you still lose the, um, the, the game of statefulness. Um, the complexity of streams, even under sequential consistency, comes from unconfined effects. It comes from the fact that when you pass a lambda in, nobody can prove, nobody can check that that lambda is doing the right thing. It's not confined. Stateless lambdas need to have the right restrictions on their causality length. You need to be able to draw a confinement circle around a, a lambda and prove that it's stateless at some point. Um, and I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice if you could crack the lambda and examine it and say, this has only stateless ops inside of it, and have that be inside of an, at least an assert in the library? so that when assertions are turned on, your library will kick your lambda back if you put the wrong you know, system out print line in it. Um, that would have some use, wouldn't it? Um, so a stateless lambda, as, as the uh, boilerplate says, it can't, it can't be the cause of side effects. It can't have outgoing causal links to go you know, do something, change it, press a button, or print a, print a line, but it also can't have incoming causal links. These arrows go both directions, and the two cases are distinct. Um, so it can't, it can't be the effect of a side cause. And I hereby um, coin the term side cause as the arrow reversal of side effect. So a, a lambda needs to be neither a side effect, side effecting or side causing, or side caused. Um, like I say, it's, it's not verifiable. It is like the Gary Larson cartoon where the, um, the family is sitting in their living room and the kids are riding tricycles around the living room and there's a snake pit in the middle and the parents are smiling and say, now Joey, stay away from that snake pit, okay? Right, and that's kind of, that's with respect to mutability and race conditions, that's where we live. So, all right, I'm just whinging, right? Um, all right, I'm gonna go through a, a, another history of logic kind of a thing to try and um, bring a few points out of one, a, a talk that Ron Pressler gave in uh, 2016 at Curion that was really good. Um, surely a smart group of people like us can just calculate the right answer. A static analysis that's really clever, like including a programmer staring at it as well as tools, that's gonna win every time. Um, we just have to know, right? We're human beings, that's what we do. We know, we know stuff. And in fact, you know, we must, we shall know. That's um, Leibniz and, and, um, and Hilbert. Hilbert was saying this just about the same time that, uh, oh, by the way, um, have you, has your boss said, uh, smart guy like you can, can give it to me next week, right? Because we really need it, right? Um, and I'm sure you can figure it out. Uh, there's some, what, what's the pointy-haired boss's slogan? Anything that's too hard for me to understand must be easy. All right, while Hilbert was saying we have to understand, uh, Gödel was, young fellow, was proving that not all proofs could be automated. And, uh, and our, our friend Turing was saying not all automata can be proven to halt. So it's not just a matter of training, talent, discipline. There are some things that really are too hard uh, 
And there's a theorem by Rice that says um, anything that you need to prove about software that isn't trivial is going to be occasionally impossible to prove except by running the software. And there's actually a get out of jail card for that. And Java found it, which is put in the online checks. If you can't prove that the array range is statically in range, no problem. We've got an online check. The Turing machine can run a long, long time and do complicated stuff, but we're going to check that range check every single time. That is a safety invariant that you can win with. And then if the, if the JIT can prove statically that you can remove the checks, you win too. So here's a link to, um, to Ron's talk. It pairs well with his uh, talk this year. Um, because it was interesting to me, I, I, I went and grabbed some hard problems um, from Wikipedia or you know, other places like that. And um, some of these are ones that Ron quoted. And I, I graphed them against, I graphed the, the, uh, the difficulty of the problem against the number of lines of code it took to express the, the problem. Okay? Um, so way down there at the bottom left is 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, and Hotspot is, um, has got a lot of lines of code in it, and it's about two-thirds of the way up the complexity spectrum. Uh, both of these uh, scales are log. So simple code is over here on the left, unaccountable behavior. Um, remember, uh, a, a, um, an abstraction is where you have a true account of a subset of the behavior. Uh, but if you have unaccountable behavior, there's, it's not abstractable. And in particular, um, the, the uh, universal Turing machine on an arbitrary input, that's not abstractable, um, except in reverse. You can say it, you can't, you, you know, you can't say anything about it. That's about the best we can do. And, and there are busy beaver machines, which also um, can't be abstracted, um, either are difficult or cannot, in principle, be abstracted. So even, even small, even small things can be unaccountable. That should make us pause when we put, think about putting our trust in static analysis. There are things that are so hard that we can't, even we can't even analyze them with the best minds on the planet. A little checker tool is going to fail sometimes, won't it? Yes. All right. Uh, here's some more details. You can look at them in your, in your, in your spare time. These, this is where the numbers came from. Um, so. Our, our safety checking is never finished. Java safety checking is inherently dynamic. It's good that it's dynamic. Um, and you get to pick one. You get to pick that online check. Or you can trust to an offline check um, if you're smart enough, and sometimes that won't work. Or you'll get an error when it doesn't work. That's, those are the choices. Um, so you can have GC, or you can have handmade storage allocation, which under the right data-dependent Turing complete conditions will fail. You can have a verifier-enforced runtime type information, or you can hand check it and blah, 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 blah. It's going to fail. You can have array range checks, or you can hand solve the Diophantine equations ahead of time, and oh, yeah, Machasevic proved that that's Turing complete too, so you're going to get a buffer overrun once in a while. Or, and likewise, uh, the new thing that I'm proposing is you can have online race detection um, or you can do st static concurrency checking and, you know, uh, uh, eyeballing of code. Uh, and then when that fails, you'll get races and various kinds of excursions and behavior. Um, dynamic safety checks, as I've been saying, are a superpower. Um, this is Java's excellent trick. Putting in dynamic safety checks that are strictly more powerful than anything C++ can do for you uh, and make them cheap enough. It's, it's, the, it's the reason Java is around, I think. It's one of the reasons, one of the big ones. So can races be made rare and, and obvious and self-diagnosing? Um, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can get our users away from the snake pit. Let's at least make immutability easier to do. Amber is working on this. But wouldn't it be nice if mutability were the rare opt-in? For new code, we can do that. Uh, we can rehabilitate racy old types, maybe. Um, arrays. Arrays are a thorn in our side because they're a special case you know, for everything, let's freeze them. Let's make them freezable, at least. That's pretty simple. Uh, harder would be uh, defining some type state that would make objects freezable also. But we're working on that. There, some parts of Valhalla will help with this. Uh, and then uh, maybe there's some new safety checks we can add. It's simple to check for rights to immutable, 
writes to frozen objects. I should not say immutable, because it sounds like immutable, right? In the audio domain, those two words that are opposite in meaning sound the same, so maybe I should just stop saying mutable and immutable. Um, in any case, and there might be some other things we can check, too. Why should you watch for racers? If I haven't convinced you already, um, well, you know, it's time for a break almost, so, but here's a few more points. Fast fail is better than slow fail. Uh, fail, uh, fa fail under load after you've shipped the product and people are relying on you, that's the worst of all. We can do better. Uh, relying on lucky hardware means you're locked into that, you're married to that hardware. If you and that hardware have a special understanding and it, it understands how you really want the Java memory model to be, you're, you're married to that hardware. Um, it's gonna be very hard to, when the breakup comes. And the rest of us are gonna move forward to better JITs, better hardware, and you're gonna be stuck on that one. You know, there's less, there's better abstractions if the racers can be, uh, can be arrested. So, some design patterns. Um, immutable objects, we can do it today, can't we? Uh, there's, some, there's some wrinkles with immutability. There's some things that are hard to do with, uh, with today's language, but it's, it's workable, and lots of people do use immutability. What would be best is to have mutability be a, um, a, a, a parameter to each object so that you could say, well, this object here is mutable because I'm busy making him up, and he's in a hidden state, and, and then I say, freeze, and then he's done, and then I can hand him out, and then he's immutable. That's the ideal. Um, don't have, a, don't have a, a fully worked out proposal for that, but I think that's where we want to go. With arrays, it's really easy. You just take an array, and then you make a snapshot of it, and what this, out of the snapshot um, factory comes a frozen thing, right? That's the obvious way to do arrays. So you do one copy to get the freeze. Um, we might give users control over the freeze operation that's already in the JMM. You, extra points for using stuff that's already in the JMM because that's a sunk cost, if it makes sense. Um, deserialization is a place where uh, or mutability and immutability are, are, are muddled up very badly. And so um, uh, a, 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 in an explicit freeze operation, we've, we've talked about this at length, um, in, um, some of us would make deserialization a lot saner. So frozen arrays, it throws an exception, kind of like an array store exception if you try to write to it. That's it. Um, at the point of the array's creation, the Java memory model says by fiat that this array acts like it has final variables, so it does a freeze operation with respect to the Java memory model. Um, so there's an there's a API. This would help a lot with varargs. This would probably cut out some future security bugs that haven't hit us yet. Okay, stable variable. It's just something we use internally. Um, it's a variable where you can see either the, the default value or the one right to the value, and it's okay if you see either one. Uh, eventually, hopefully, you see only the, the written value, but it's okay if you see the default value. This is a super useful um, concept inside the VM. Right now, it's for family only because there's no mechanical checking that it's used properly. If it were to be given out to everybody, unfortunately, it would be abused not by anybody in this room, but by black hat hackers looking to introduce race conditions. Yeah, and arrays can be stable as well as frozen. Uh, monotonic variables, um, you know, you could have variables that only count up, so you can, you can make conclusions about their state. If you see a state, then you know that the, all future states will, will, will never be lower than that, so you can take that as, as some sort of a given. Um, so they, they're, I think there are interesting things we can do in this area if we want to build new kinds of abstractions based on controlled state changes. But the real important thing is mutability and uh, thread confinement. Um, how about a function that says assert, throw an error if this thing is not already confined, this object, if, if it's not already locked by my thread. That by itself would be A, optimizable, B, uh, fairly easy to use, and C, it would find a lot of the race conditions that currently go under the radar. Um, a, a simpler version of that would be, um, well, you, you might be able to build on top of that primitive a race-resistant class where all of the accessors had that little race check in them, and maybe we could build them in, in implicitly, like in the, in the compiler or in the VM, even put it in the put field. So it's a new kind of a volatile field. It's a race-resistant race field. 
don't know whether to do this. Um, there is another design pattern I think we're looking at, which is the thread confined class, which is a, a, an object that just basically wakes up and he's in a thread from, from birth, right? There's no lock operation on him. His constructor puts him in the thread and then thereafter any, anybody from outside the thread that touches him blows up. That would be also cut out a lot of the sort of typical race conditions that we see in, in, um, in, in, when, we, when we observe them. Um, this pattern can apply to arrays too. Uh, we are ex experimenting seriously with this design pattern in Panama as a way of managing um, off-heap references safely. Uh, an extension to it would be, be being able to take these objects and hand them off between threads using a handshake that would be you know, a release, acquire handshake between threads. Um, another thought here. Um, Make the best of the object header. We're already spending 64 bits on every object header for what? For synchronized, which how many people use it all the time? Uh, well, you know, it, there, there's Doug Lee's locks, which are often better for particular purposes. Wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow integrate the, um, the Doug Lee locks into the, the object header more closely, make them more programmable? Uh, so the, the, um, the assert locked um, uh, co um, proposal is an example of making more use of the object header. Um, also, we're going to have to put a micro lock for, um, for fields that are multi-word but atomics, and that would be another place for it. Um, and there's other things we can do with, uh, we can replay some of our bias locking adventures, which failed because of um, uh, something called lock re revocation, which if you're doing this kind of structured confinement model, you don't have that failure case, so uh, you can bring back bias locking as an optimization. All right, just to give you an idea of how I think some of these ideas could apply to current projects that you will be hearing about the rest of the week. Um, I'm going through this fast, these are my last few slides. Valhalla, value types, um, because the value types are confinable, they can be stored in registers. Yay, we win. Uh, because we can confine their reads and writes under atomicity, uh, we're gonna need some help with that, then that's another way that confinement um, can be improved by, uh, by multi-word Valhalla types. Valhalla also includes specialization. Um, we might be able to uh, tie special JMM behaviors to certain system polymorphic value holders. Um, uh, packed lists will provide alternatives to the, the racy arrays. And um, maybe we can behave on, we can specialize on, on behavior of locking as well as type. Um, in Amber, of course, we're, we're trying very hard to get to a um, immutable data model for new, for new, new code. Um, this is a place where frozen arrays would help. Um, defensive copying, by the way, is bad for the same reason mutability is bad. It's like it's a cost that you have to pay over and over again to, to, to try and, and get ahead of the racers that are trying to attack you. Um, a frozen, frozenness and immutability gets you away from, from defensive copying. Project Panama, as I've said, um, we're using minimal value, we're using um, confinement patterns for scopes. We're also doing the vector API, which you'll hear about later. Uh, we're using minimal value types to be able to describe uh, vectors that can be loaded into registers. And that's um, something you can't do as well with objects because of the, the, um, the Java memory model effects. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I, in order to take questions, I'm gonna skip over this, um, but there's, um, there's a lot of places in Panama which have excited me into thinking that we can do better with mutability, we can do better with confinement, we can be, do better with, uh, with type, type state. Project Metropolis needs certain kinds of confinement in order to, for example, if we're ever going to be able to execute bootstrap methods ahead of time, we're gonna to need to be able to take those, those um, method handles and say, you, O oh method handle, I can tell that you're safe to execute at compile time. That is a confinement problem. Um, if we want, as Bernard said, to load Java code into the JVM and have it become part of the JVM, then that Java code that's part of the JVM needs to not interfere with the application Java code, like by causing GCs that, that are embarrassing. That is, an, that is a, con, a confinement problem. Um, that's true not just for Graal, but it's for any, any part of the VM that we code in, in, recode in Java. We recode the verifier in Java. I'd like to do that someday. Uh, it's gonna have to be confined 
by a special AOT algorithm that keeps that verifier from have, being affected by or affecting the wrong parts of the VM. So yeah, I, I've said confinement a few times. Um, the main point is uh, our mutability story needs some help. Um, so let's at least add freezing. Um, that'll block a lot of bad writes and make it easier to pick the right write for every read and maybe add racer arresting. And let's say aim for libraries which can, uh, can work with con um, confined lambdas, which means really crack crackable lambdas. We're going to need to work out rules for what it means to have pure code and data. Luckily, the D language and C++ and other languages have gone there ahead of us, so we have some selective sedimentation. We don't need to make that be a science project, doing pure code and data. Um, that spool there, you'll see on the goodie, it's uh, part of this year's graphic. It's a, it's a thread spool, obviously, but it's, um, it's somehow alive. The threads are, um, are an invasive species here, and, but they've been confined in a, uh, in a da Vinci um, polyhedron, so we're safe, right? And that takes me to the end. Um, I have a few minutes for questions, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>